Hi, Jenna. You're the only one on so far. Welcome, Alexa. We'll get started in a couple minutes. Welcome Jordan and Jack. Um, I can't see you, but I can see that you're there. We will get started in another minute or two. Well, I don't help if I unmuted myself. <laughs> hey, Jenna. Hi. <laughs> I said it so that everybody's automatically muted when they join, but you can unmute yourself if you want. Oh, oh, interesting. Okay, sorry. I'll unmute it. That's okay. Welcome, Patrick. We'll get started in a couple minutes. Ten o'clock, but I'll let's wait a couple minutes to let people figure out technology and Zoom and get on before we get started.
All right, well, it looks like it's just the six of us. Um, great, well, welcome. <clears throat> this will be a normal class time. Um, I've never, I guess I've been in a Zoom meeting before. I've never led a Zoom meeting. This is all very new to me. Um, but uh, there is a chat window. You can type a message if you want. Um, you can unmute yourself and talk. There's only six of us, so I don't think it's gonna get too overwhelming. Um, is there interest in seeing the astronomy picture of the day? All right, I see two nods. Let's do it. Um, okay, this is where I think I can do this. I'm sharing my, are you seeing the astronomy picture of the day now? Excellent, okay. So today's astronomy picture of the day, a black hole disrupts a passing star. Um, what's going on here? This is obviously, maybe it's not obvious. This is not an actual image of taken by a telescope. This is an artist's conception of what might be happening we haven't talked about black holes, but it's coming in the next couple of weeks. Um, but what are they? They're giant, massive, um, very small objects in space. Uh, they're so massive that they can disrupt things that are around them. It's not like things just, black holes don't suck things in, um, but if things get too close, the gravity is so strong that it can disrupt those things. Here is an artist's description, depiction of, let's zoom way in, of a black hole, that's the dot in the center, disrupting a star. So the star hasn't fallen directly into the black hole. If it did, it would just sort of disappear. It is, has enough, a small amount of angular momentum that takes it around the black hole. It's entering a very elliptical orbit around the black hole. And so, um, but the tidal forces, we haven't talked about that. That's the difference in force between one side of an object and the other becomes so big near a black hole that the thing actually gets ripped apart. And um, people have done models, which is why this picture is here of how and why this might happen. Um, but you can see stuff from the star that has been ripped out by these tidal forces, still in sort of an elliptical orbit around the black hole. And um, the stuff that gets really close to the black hole will get very hot because um, it gets compressed and very close together and frictional forces will make it very hot. And this thing will glow rather brightly in the x-rays and they say it could be almost as bright as some of the brightest objects in the universe like supernovae and things, which we haven't talked about either. So there you go, starting picture of the day. If you haven't looked at yesterday's trying picture of the day, um, I did a viewing of it in the first of the video lectures, which you can take a look at. It's this, it's pretty cool, very large region of the sky, the Pleiades at the top, and you can see a beautiful depiction of yesterday's, of today's lecture topic, the interstellar medium, and all of the clumpiness and weirdness and non vacuumy stuff that is actually space. Okay, great, that's a pod. Um, so I don't really have anything to present here. If you're interested in the topic, um, there are the YouTube videos you can take a look at for lecture for yesterday, but I'm happy to answer questions or talk about how you're doing and coping with the coronavirus. My coronavirus beard is coming along nicely. Um, uh, so what do you got? Let me, oh, you can't, you can't see me. Maybe I'll stop sharing that. There we go. I'm back. I mean, coronavirus. <laughs> uh. Coronavirus beard. <laughs> yeah, my dad had to shave his beard because he has to like wear a mask to work. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so he was like right? really upset. <laughs> <laughs> That's too bad. Sad. My wife hates hates a beard, but it, it's here for now. So, what can you do? Are you at Genesis? Are you like in your office? I am in my office now. Um, there's nobody else around. We've been given permission to come in as long as we're not near anybody else. I've seen one other person who sort of waved as we walked by um, in the 45 minutes I've been here. So, yep. So my dog isn't here. You know, if I my dog made a cameo appearance in the first video, but he's not. Here. Uh -huh. How's everybody doing? Holding up? Um, sure. So far, not too bad. That's good. Hey, Bailey. Hey. Your dog is really cute. I was just watching the first video. <laughs> yeah, he's adorable. He's kind of an asshole sometimes. But... 
<laughs> you can't really yeah. stay mad at them for long. Right, yeah. They get you with the face. They do. They're too, they're too adorable. Aha! Great. A question from Jordan Cooper. Thank you, Jordan. Let's talk some astronomy. Number eight on the practice test. So let's pull that up. Um, I should have had that open and I forgot. Let me so it's it. on Canvas, right? It is on Canvas. You can pull up the practice test on Canvas. Um, exam two, practice midterm two. Let me share this with you so we can all see it. That's it. Okay, seeing this now? Mm -hmm. Okay, number eight. On an average day, the total energy consumption of the United States is about four and a half times 10 to the 16 joules of energy. If we could convert matter directly into energy, how much matter would we need to annihilate per day in order to generate this much energy? Okay, so, um, Ooh, it's been a while. We're after spring break. This is a um, sun-powered energy uh, question. Um, <clears throat> so let me, well, one of the reasons I want to use Zoom is so I can do this. Watch this. Oh, let me share my iPhone or iPad via cable. Okay, this is the thing that didn't work. Why did sharing pause? See, this is what happened before. Are you seeing my yes. whiteboard now? Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, I think I just forgot to just touch it or something. Anyway, okay. So if you're gonna convert matter directly into energy, how much energy do you get for a given amount of matter? That's E equals MC squared problem. If you wanna convert matter directly into energy, how much energy you get is M times C squared. In this case, we know how much energy we need to generate in a particular day, and we wanna know how much mass that corresponds to. So we can solve this thing for C squared, divide both sides by C squared. The amount of mass you need is just the amount of energy you need divided by C squared. So um, if you go back to the question, the energy is four and a half times 10 to the 16 joules. Whoops. Um, e equals four and a half times 10 to the 16 joules. C squared, we know C is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. C squared is that squared, squared this three is nine, double the eight is 16, nine times 10 to the 16 meters squared per second squared, but you're welcome to use a calculator if you need to. Just dividing those two numbers now. M equals E, 4.5 times 10 to the 16 joules or kilograms times meters per second, meters, kilograms times meters squared per second squared, divided by C squared, which is nine times 10 to the 16 meters squared per second squared. Look at that, the numbers worked out pretty nicely. M equals, so 10 to the 16 goes away, 10 to the 16 goes away, four and a half divided by nine is exactly a half. The 10, there's no 10, this is just a half. Meters squared per second squares cancel on the top and bottom. I just have kilograms. And the answer is a half a kilogram, which is pretty amazing. This is an extraordinarily efficient way to make energy, which is why the sun can last for five, 10 billion years. It would only, if you could convert matter directly into energy, it would only take a half a kilogram of, of mass to power the entire United States for an entire day with that energy. Um, so I know if we can ever, and this is how antimatter works, right? Ma antimatter, if you had a half a kilogram of antimatter, actually a quarter of a kilogram of antimatter and combine it with a quarter kilogram of matter, you would get that much energy out because they would completely annihilate one another. So, but antimatter is hard to make and hard to contain. So that's not really a, a viable energy source yet, but um, there's a tremendous, the potential energy in mass is, is enormous. Okay, let's go back to stop share. Uh -oh. oh, there we go, back, I'm back, cool. I have a question. Yes, Jenna. Um, number two on the homework. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, okay. Yeah. Let me Do you want that. me to pull up my Kappa? Sure, if you want to. Um, I can find it. Hold on. I have too many tabs open as per usual. Um, can you share also? That's a yeah. Um, I don't know how much of my screen you can see. I can see all of it. Yeah. <laughs> Including the um, session. <laughs> yeah. And all of your links. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, Including the University of Michigan link. Have you heard about your REU? Um, it didn't get canceled yet. So. Okay. <laughs> That's Fingers good. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Many of them have been already. I know. Like, I got an email this morning that apparently um, uh, Georgia Tech got canceled. And yep. Another internship got canceled, but not Michigan yet. Yeah. Oh God, I hope Cornell doesn't get canceled. I <laughs> uh, know. All right, Bailey. That would be so so bad. That would be so sad. Oof. Fingers okay. crossed. Okay, number two. You're scrolling yeah. down. Okay, here we go. Sorry. Go. <laughs> number two. Um, <clears throat> I should pull up like the actual like. Oops, that's check. <laughs> How the heck do you have so many tabs open, my guy? This is Chegg. like a normal. <laughs> is it Chegg for this? There's a check, yeah. <laughs> you paid for check, oh my guy. Um, I didn't. I well, okay. Like originally, I shared it with like five other people, but okay. Wait, this is math methods. Oops. I have like too many tabs open. <laughs> I might actually have to pull up like. <laughs> I'm so disillusioned now. I'll yeah. pull up mine. I'll pull up mine. How about that? <laughs> it's Maybe a good deal. Funny. Okay, I'll stop sharing. <laughs> uh, I apologize. <laughs> Okay, here's mine, the PDF version. <laughs> um, so number two is uh, order the digital spectra above from hottest to coldest. Um, so you already figured out which was which, right? Yeah. So you figured out one. It took That's me just, like a whole hour. Right. So um, the thing to know is um, the, the hint here is at the very top. The picture shows seven absorption spectra with O at the top and B next, and so on down to M. These are in order, O, B, A, F, G, K, M, right? So, o, so number one is the hottest, and number two is the next hottest, and number three is the next hottest, right? So once you've figured out which is which in number one, which you have, so whichever one corresponded to one, spectrum one, that's the hottest. Oh, it's that easy? <laughs> it's that easy. <laughs> But you had, well, you had to know and see that O was the, the hottest at the top and M was the coolest at the bottom. But yeah, that's it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, I'm angry that I spent so much time on that one. We've all been there, my guy. <laughs> I actually also have a question on the cat bug. Sure. Can we go over questions 10 and 11? Yeah. Yeah, I was on that one too. <laughs> right. So here's 10 and 11. We're looking at this um, plot of, I showed a plot like this in one of the video uh, sessions. These are pre-main sequence tracks, which means that they're showing the motion on the HR diagram, meaning how the surface temperature and luminosity are changing over time for newly formed stars before they reach the main sequence. So, um, what is the difference between this top one and the second one? Well, these are tracks of different mass, right? Here is the one solar mass star probably here. Um, here's a half solar mass star. Here's a tenth of a solar mass star. These are, each of these tracks corresponds to a uh, star of a different mass. So stars, um, uh, each of the tracks, each of the tracks has a specific mass. So I've just told you the answer to them. Um, and I've also kind of told you the answer to 11 also. Did that answer the question and help? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. We're going to be looking at these a lot for post main sequence evolution too, like in next week. I have like Professor. an off topic. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, you're okay. I was just going to say, um, I got to head out, but it was good to see you guys. Good to see you, Bailey. All right. Have fun, guys. Bye. 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 Go ahead, Jenna. Oh, um, so the test is technically on Thursday, right? Um, the test is technically on Thursday, right. So, um, but it, you can take it in any 75-minute 
window between Thursday at 10 o'clock when our class starts and Sunday evening. Okay, perfect. So you can take it anytime. Sweet. Just don't post your answers to Chegg or anything. I won't. <laughs> I don't think I'm smart enough for Chegg. <laughs> um. Welcome, Sarah. Hello. Hey. We're mostly just hanging out, but if you have a question about uh, practice midterm or um, homework or astronomy or life or anything, let me know. Oh, I finally found the PDF. <laughs> This is a totally different tab. <laughs> Good job. Oh man. Welcome, Dom. Dom and I, Dom, Dom's on. Well, Dom just got on. I don't know if she can hear me. Um, because she could. Yes. Hear me. Hi, I can hear you. Yay! Zoom Good. works better. I guess. Yeah. Um, just so Dom and I tried out uh, Blackboard Collaborate yesterday and there were some nice things about it, but there's some kind of crazy not nice things about it also. Um, yeah. I, let me tell you why I'm using Zoom, Dom. It's so that I can, I, I, have, I can actually, I don't know if you have an iPad or anything, but if you do, you can attach it with cable and actually share it. And if you download some, um, you're not seeing this, are you? No. Oh, there we oh go. yes, okay. You're seeing it now? Uh, um, so I can actually share my iPad and I can write on this thing with a stylus. Oh, wow. And it's really easy. I'm still not that good at it, but it's way better than it would be if I were using my hand, say. Is this just an hand. app that you got on your iPad? Um, yeah, this is, this is Smart Notebook, although Microsoft OneNote works well too. Um, you could probably use your phone, although your screen space would be extremely small. Yeah, well. Um, but I, ha I just bought a $10 stylus, and this is a free app. So um, this might be a way to go for Zoom instead of Blackboard Family. OK, cool. I'll, uh, I'll have to test it out. Cool. Any other questions? 19 on the practice test. Thank you for your question, Jordan. Okay, that's not the practice test. Where does the practice test go? Let me share it. Are you allowed to be in the building? Um, yeah, I'm in the building. Um, yes, we have been given permission to, as long as we don't interact with anybody, be in the building. So I'm in my office now. Um, that's not it. Um, and I've only seen one other person in the hour I've been here. So there you go. Number 19. Okay. Ah, yes. This is probably one of the more complicated questions on the whole practice midterm. Um, which of them has the highest luminosity um, of these four stars? So um, you're not given the information directly on these th four stars. So you're given a parallax angle. Excuse me, and you're given an apparent magnitude. So if I'd asked you which one looks the brightest, that would be really easy. You just for look for the one that has the smallest apparent magnitude, which in this case would be Arcturus. But I asked you which has the highest luminosity, which has the intrinsically highest brightness. And that you don't actually know. So um, how do you figure that out? Well, you need an absolute magnitude to get a, uh, a relative luminosity. Uh, but we have everything we need to know to calculate the actual absolute luminous absolute magnitudes of all of these stars because we have their parallax angle we know that we can calculate distance from parallax angle as d equals one over p let me share with you my ipad okay you're seeing that now good oh no you're not there it is, d equals one over p. Um, so uh, you can take every single one of those parallax angles. Let's do, I don't know, doesn't really matter. Um, just take one of them, take the inverse of that parallax angle. 
and that gives you the distance. Once you know the distance, you can use the distance modulus equation, apparent magnitude minus absolute magnitude equals five times the log of the distance in parsecs minus five. So this is a rather complicated question. One of the more involved questions I could ask on a midterm um, because you really have to calculate the absolute magnitude of all four of those stars and see which one is the smallest. Um, but this is the procedure to do it. Take the distance, do one over P, let's do one of them. Um, bring up my calculator app. Um, so let's do the first one. Rigel has a parallax angle of 0.0042. One divided by 0.0042 is one over X, 238. D equals 238. So we can plug that in. The apparent magnitude is 0 0.18. So 0 0.18 minus absolute magnitude equals five, oops, five times the log, oops. I'm not very good at this yet. My, my, my wrist keeps hitting those arrows. Log D, and in this case, it is, I also have a nice, five times the log of uh, 238 minus five. 238, if you take the log base 10 of that, you get a number that's like 2.38, which is weird because 238, wow, that's cool. Five times 2.38 minus five, multiply 2.38 times five, you get, 11.9, 11.9 minus five is 6.9, ah, stop it. And that is 0 0.18 minus your absolute magnitude. Um, so we can add, we can subtract 0 0.18 from both sides. On my calculator, that gives me 6.72, um, and that's negative m. So if you multiply both sides by negative one now, positive m is negative 6.72. That was a lot. You have to repeat that three times, three more times for Betelgeuse, Arcturus, and Amprocyon. And the one that has the um, smallest apparent magnitude will be the, will be the most luminous. I think these all have fairly similar apparent magnitudes. It's really the distance that matters here. Um, and so I think that since Rigel has the smallest parallax angle and it is the farthest away, that it has the largest luminosity, certainly larger than Procyon, which is fainter than it, uh, certainly larger than Betelgeuse, which is fainter than it and further away, and probably also faint, more, more luminous than Arctura. So again, if you understand how this stuff works, um, you will know, you can see that you don't really have to do all of them. In other words, um, uh, let, me, let me share Betelgeuse, let me share the, stop share there. I'm going to share now my practice midterm again. Okay, so again, even without doing any math, what can you say? you know that Rigel is further away than all of them because it has the smallest parallax angle and it's among the brightest. Betelgeuse, which is closer to us and, has, and is fainter, must have a lower luminosity. Procyon, which is closer to us and fainter than Rigel, must have a lower luminosity. Arcturus ap appears brighter, but it's a lot closer. Um, so you might have to go through and actually do the math for Arcturus, but um, I'm, I'm guessing that A is in fact the right answer even without actually going through all the rest of them. Good question. That's probably the hardest one on the whole exam. Any other questions? We probably have about um, 10 more minutes, I'm guessing, before Zoom kicks us out. Okay, 24 and 25, let's do it. Aha. Yes, so.
<clears throat> 24 and 25 all refer to this diagram up here. Um, so we've got four different clusters um, and we need to figure out in 24, which is the youngest. Um, and we can do that by figuring out where the main sequence turnoff is. If you look at cluster D over here, um, it has almost all of these stars on the main sequence. Um, so these stars at the very top are on the main sequence, stars at the very bottom are on the main sequence. These stars, oops, I just got a 10 minute warning on my Zoom meeting. These stars at the top will be, um, are the very massive stars. They live very short lives. D must be a very young cluster because these stars are still on the main sequence. B must be the next youngest cluster because it has the next bluest turnoff point, right? Uh, the turnoff point in D is in the B stars. The turnoff point in, 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 um, in, in cluster B is in the F stars. These are uh, lower mass stars that live much longer on the main sequence. And so B must be a little bit older than D. A is a little bit older than that because it's the G stars that are turning off. Uh, cluster C must be the oldest because the K stars are already turning off. You can tell just based on where this turnoff point is, which of these clusters is the youngest in order of youngest, oldest, D, B, A, and then C. So D is the youngest. Now, that doesn't tell you the exact age of any of these unless you happen to know the main sequence lifetime of the star that's actually turning off. So um, which of these clusters must be about 10 billion years old? Well, again, there's a couple of things we have to know now. Uh, one is, do you, know the, do you know of a star that has a main sequence lifetime of exactly 10 billion years or so? Anyone? Um, a main sequence star? Yeah, so like, a main sequence lifetime of 10 billion years. Can you think of a star that has that? I don't know off the top of my head. There's a really Isn't the sun star. 10 the billion sun. years? The sun oh. has a main sequence lifetime of 10 billion years. We did yeah. that calculation. It's one of those numbers <laughs> that, you, that, you, uh, that you might want to know. So <laughs> we need to know which cluster has, a, has, a main sequ has, a, has an age of 10 billion years. It's the one where the sun is turning off the main sequence, just this. That happens to be cluster A. This one solar, lum solar luminosity G star, that is the sun right there, just turning off the main sequence. Cluster A must be 10 billion years old. C must be older, B and D must be younger. Good question, Jordan. That was also a tricky one. I have a question. Um, so I'm looking at a Hertzsprung Russell diagram right now. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I am. Um, now, is the luminosity axis, that's not inverted, is it? It is not. Um, okay. A normal HR diagram, uh, let's go back, let me share this one again, because we were looking at the normal HR diagram. Um, it is confusing, so let's go back. So here, I'm sharing my midterm with you again. Yep. Um, so this is a normal HR diagram. It's temperature on the x-axis, which is inverted, hot on the left, cool on the right. It's a luminosity axis on the left, which is not inverted, bright on the top and faint on the left. However, you can also, this is just luminosity, in log, in log space, right, in, in solar luminosity units. But it's possible, and sometimes you'll see this it, with absolute magnitude. And in that case, the small numbers are the, are the, are the um, most luminous. And so the numbers are inverted on the left, even though the scale is not, if that makes sense. The small numbers at the top and the large numbers are at the bottom, if you use absolute magnitude. But it's still l most luminous on top and least luminous on the bottom. That okay, so yes, so if something is more luminous, it will have a larger number. Uh, not on a, not an absolute magnitude. Absolute magnitude is the same as apparent magnitude in that it's backwards. Okay. But in luminosity units, yes, it will have a larger number. And it will be at the top. HR diagrams will always have the most luminous things at the top, no matter what the scale is on the left. Okay, we have about five minutes left. Any other questions? Question 31, let's do it.
What is the best wavelength regime to review protostars that are still embedded in their molecular cloud? Excellent. Um, this is something that uh, I believe is on, I don't know, video two or three from, from, from uh, today's lectures. Um, and so uh, the answer to that, so somebody just had to know, uh, is infrared. Um, it turns out the longer the wavelength, um, the easier it is for light to, to pass through um, molecular clouds in space. Um, and so you'll see um, there's, a, there's a cool example that I show of a, of, a, of a field in visible light and you just see a very dark patch of sky and nothing's there. And I show the exact same field in the infrared and you can see this bright star right in the middle of that, what was the black patch before that is a protostar, a baby star that's still embedded in its molecular cloud. Um, so that the answer, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm circling ultraviolet, but the answer is actually infrared. Okay, we've got about four minutes. Any other questions? 33, let's do it. If a 50 solar mass cloud were begin to collapse due to gravity, what would you expect the end result? Again, this is also something that I showed in the video lecture, I think in three yesterday. Um, uh, I actually showed a simulation of a 50 solar mass cloud beginning to, beginning to collapse. So you should go watch it. Um, it's kind of fascinating, uh, but you don't get, you get, um, uh, you get many stars with varying masses. You do not expect the more massive stars to be more common. This is another lesson from yesterday. You expect less massive stars to be more common. Um, and so you get many stars with varying masses with less massive stars being more common. That is the, that is the right answer to that one. Three minutes left. I feel like this is the countdown to doom or something. 22. Uh, aha, yes. So uh, the following three questions refer to stars A and B. Star A has a spectral type of G, an absolute magnitude of five. Star B has a spectral type of K, an absolute magnitude of one. So um, obviously it's obvious, well, I don't know if it's obvious, but it should be clear which is the most luminous. You don't have to do any math at all. The one with the smaller apparent magnitude is the more luminous star. And so that would be star B, um, the answer to 21. 22 is how much many times more luminous is this star. Again, this is the magnitude equation. Um, let me share quickly the iPad. You seeing that now? Yes, you are. Excellent. So the magnitude equation is this: um, m1 minus m2 equals negative 2.5 ah, times the log of the ratio of the luminosities. So all you have to do, um, in this case, it's negative 1 minus 5 equals negative 2.5 times the log of the ratio of the luminosities. Wow, this isn't much better than using my finger, but it's a little bit better. So negative one minus five is negative six. Um, divide both sides by negative 2.5. This is where you need your calculator. I'm not sure what this number is gonna be, but that's the log of L1 over L2. And this is where you need to take both sides and raise it to the power 10 to both sides. And you'll get L1 over L2, which is the number you want, is equal to 10 raised to the power of negative six divided by negative 2.5. I don't remember exactly what that number is, but um, that's, that's the procedure for doing that. Okay. Is that good enough, Alexa? Yes, thank you. Or Jordan, you. sorry. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, less than a minute to go, so um, maybe we'll stop it there. Um, if you have other questions, you can um, email me or we'll be back uh, here to do this again on Thursday. Um, good luck being safe and healthy. Um, I hope everybody has a good day um, and we'll see you again on Thursday if you'd like to join us. Thanks.